Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run the services um, at medcomsnetworking.com and associated websites. So information services, resources, activities, and so on for people who work in and around the global medcoms business, by which I mean medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, um, and, and for people who are interested in learning more about the business. Um, and, 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 and particularly, if you're interested in a career in medcoms, you'll find we provide lots of information at first medcoms job. Com. So uh, do go and have a look if you're interested. Uh, you'll find we do lots of these webinars now. I've done a lot over the last few years um, and there's lots more video content over at Network Pharma TV. So the recording of today will be at Network Pharma TV or being well later on today but there's about 400 and something videos now so there's a lot of good content over there and um, one of the great things about these webinars at the moment is we can involve people from all over um, as panelists and speakers but also as audience uh, we've got a good international audience again today thank you very much everybody for joining us um, today i'm actually delighted to have um, antonia and james from medchef um, and and the specific type theme of today is um, how are how are healthcare professionals how have they changed in terms of their behaviours over the years into as digital activity has, has changed. Um, but specifically, I'm interested in maybe what's happened over the last couple of years. I think we've all changed our, our, our attitudes and our working practices, but um, specifically, I'm interested in how the healthcare professionals are working um, differently. And specifically, I'm interested in what MedShare are doing um, in terms of their platform and so on. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to James and let him introduce, um, as I say, a presentation and then some Q&A. So those of you in the audience, today please do fire in your questions and answers james over to you excellent many thanks peter and thank you to everybody from around the world from the uk wales india and america at least so far um, so looking forward to the discussion and take you through the topics peter just referenced um, super quick intros from our side. So I'm James, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at MedShare. So essentially oversee the commercial team and the engagements that we have with industry. And um, so we work directly with pharmaceutical companies and then also with uh, MedCon's agencies as well. So I think I noticed a couple of names are on the line, but looking forward to getting to know more of you. Uh, my background is on the, well, at least kind of part last 12 years or so in the healthcare consultancy and agency space. And so doing some enterprise customer experience consulting, but also a lot of portfolio and brand strategy and, and medical strategy. Um, Antonia, do you want to say hello? Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. So I'm Antonia. I'm Chief Medical Officer at, at MedShare. Um, I'm a doctor by uh, background and training, uh, but joined MedShare three years ago to build our clinical teams. So my role really sits across our network and our community, um, but, but I also with a, a hand in terms of our pharma engagement programs, in particular on the medical side. Um, so I will be talking to you a little bit more about our physicians, um, their behaviours and what we've learned. Excellent. And I think in reality, in this presentation, people are going to be looking forward to hearing what a real doctor thinks. So I'll move through mine, my section relatively swiftly. Uh, but essentially, we are considering how is the digital world changing for doctors and how can the MedCom's community effectively respond to this? Um, one quick thing I will flag is, yeah, maybe somewhat ironically, uh, given the topic, I'm actually having to hotspot from my phone currently uh, because of some Wi-Fi issues. So just to preempt, if, if we do have any challenges, um, we will, uh, you know, we've got a contingency plan in place and we'll, we'll look to address that. Um, but yeah, I've always been advised to start presentations with a bit of a bang. So I thought I'd start this one with a bit more of a, a risk uh, in terms of levels of anxiety for the audience, but you know, rest assured, we're not going to be spending uh, this time talking about Peter's uh, NFT collection. Um, but we are talking about digital, and we're specifically talking about kind of the evolution of the internet and what that means for how we engage clinicians. So the birth of the internet, typically, I think, seen around 1983, now nostalgically looked back on as Web 1.0. Um, you know, massive leaps forward in terms of information delivery, but also massive frustration um, with dial-up modems and pages. If everybody, anybody remembers those, it feels a bit like how it feels now, I think, when I'm trying to charge my electric car with the current uh, charging infrastructure. Um, but then that shift to Web, web, web 2.0, kind of kicking in around the turn of the century, Facebook launched in 2004. And you know, the key thing here is that shift to interaction. Um, so participating rather than just kind of consuming digital content. 
So gave birth to social media, but you know, software on the web like Google Docs, platforms like eBay. Um, and now we're in a third wave of, of web um, that focuses on more aspects like kind of identity and verification and decentralization. So we're less focused on that, that end of the spectrum, but very much looking at kind of that shift from 1.0 to 2.0 and what that means for, for us. Apologies, a bit of a build there. Um, so before we get into that, I just wanted to ask a quick question. So thinking back to January and that kind of shift from 1.0 to 2.0 in mind, what was the top type of website, do you think, or app that was used in January of this year? Um, so this is from a survey of, of internet users from 16 to 64. So, you know, is it things like uh, news maybe, or e-commerce, social media, maybe pharmaceutical medical portals? Um, does anybody want to put a suggestion in the chat or the Q&A? TikTok as a specific, yeah, absolutely massive platform. Uh, YouTube, yeah, absolutely. So both kind of social and then, yeah, Amazon. So e-commerce, again, a massive, yeah, a massive resource there. So you're all kind of in the right ballpark and ultimately all those are, are broadly speaking in, in the right ballpark. Um, but yeah, 96% of, of global internet users using chat and messaging and 95% using a social network. Crazy numbers. And I think it's, it can be easy to kind of brush off those stats. Stats have all been kind of familiar with, with those stats, but you know, anybody using the internet in January was essentially using those tools. Like it's very much part of the fabric of our daily lives. And as we'll see in particular, when we get to Antonia's presentation, it's part of the fabric of, of doctors' lives as well. So kind of digging into that shift a bit more, not only are people using social media all the time, they're using it a lot. Um, so, you know, almost two and a half hours of it and across seven different platforms. And also that shift from um, to mobile, essentially. So it's interesting when you think about what are the top websites visited, it's really a combination of kind of apps and websites just because of that sheer volume of, of mobile usage. Um, and then, so let's think about what that means in terms of healthcare professionals. And I'm going to reference a joke here from a, an, an old colleague of mine, Fred Bassett, um, which is trying to look at this through, through the kind of the web 2.0 environment for the doctor. So we see the sort of unfeasibly handsome and relaxed doctor saying, fantastic, I can use on-demand symposia and multi-channel communications to improve my clinical choices and reduce the industry's cost of interacting with me. So I think in person, uh, normally the, the response to this slide is a little easier to read than on Zoom, um, but normally we at least get some, some chuckling um, and then also some people sort of shifting a bit uncomfortably in their seats. And if we think, why is that? You know, why is this making us feel uncomfortable? It's essentially because we've expressed our agenda or what we would like as a kind of a medcoms community through the mouth of, of our audience. And the reality is that physicians don't see this, the world in this way, and, and their reality is very different. Um, so at a kind of a, a higher level, you know, physicians in particular, you know, off the back of, of COVID are, are burnt out and significantly impacted by the pandemic. Just the volume of kind of cumulative medical research is doubling. Um, and in therapy areas like oncology or hematology, you know, almost impossible to keep up um, with essentially an exponentially increasing volume of data, but I think also an industry that's kind of exponentially keen to then target and engage these clinicians as well. Um, so the preferences, I think this is really useful and, and valuable for a Medcoms audience is, you know, shifting from more of that promotional content to data-driven and medical content, um, shorter form information that we're really delivering at the point of need, you know, so we, you know, doctors don't want to be data scientists. They want to be able to kind of ultimately just treat their patients more um, effectively. Clearly, COVID unfortunately has not gone away, um, and unsurprisingly, it um, it has changed things. I think we've all seen sort of 101 different COVID stats, but the main thing we wanted to highlight is behaviours um, where we might may and might not uh, return from from baseline. So, you know, massive acceleration of, of remote and virtual touch points, net number of interactions still lagging, but also physicians discovering, you know, that the interactions with pharma, and this is more on the rep side than the MSL side, in particular face-to-face, -face, um, you know, that reduction isn't necessarily something that they, well, they, you know, that, that can be a good thing and aren't necessarily looking for a return to where things were previously. Um, it's interesting that the kind of the changing physician behaviors and, and that move to online is reflected in kind of the evolution of the online landscape. 
But I think what's interesting is, and if you think back to that first slide in terms of 1.0, 2.0 and Web3, that shift from the 1.0 to 2.0 model is still lagging, I would say, even with um, you know, increasing number of, of, um, of organizations that exist. So still a lot of longer form content, a lot of static content rather than interactive content, um, and still and not so much of that kind of that, that genuine community. Um, moving slightly to MedShare. Um, so Peter gave us a bit of an introduction there, um, but how we are working and how we fit in terms of that shift from 1.0 to 2.0. So if anybody that doesn't know, MedShare is a community platform for doctors and um, focused on the sharing and discussion, discussion of clinical cases and content, um, but doing that in a, in a structured environment. So we enable doctors to create and share clinical cases. It's a short form um, mobile first mechanic. So about 90% of the usage on our platform is, is through the app. And that's ultimately driving towards our mission of sharing knowledge and, and saving lives. Um, so, you know, the majority of the content on our platform is user generated and it's from by doctors for doctors. Um, we are also working with industry um, to partner and deliver information as well. I think it's interesting that unlike pharma, who saw a massive you know, drop off in terms of interactions and engagement as a result of the pandemic, we were already seeing you know, accelerated growth, but we, we saw further acceleration of that in the pandemic. So adding a million new members in the last 12 months and hitting the milestone uh, last month of, of 2 million members around the world to so 195 countries. Um, to give you a bit more context in terms of uh, why HCPs come to MedShare, you know, ultimately it's addressing the pain points that we saw earlier um, and it's meeting needs. So it's kind of aligned with those broader behavioral shifts that have been enabled by these kind of web 2.0 web platforms and services. Um, we are gaining users because we're aligned with that. So it's short form uh, content, it's uh, rich content as well. So we've got video content on there um, and it's tailored. So the sort of the information that you see as a doctor is, is relevant to you um, and your specialty. Um, it's asynchronous, so it can be accessed and engaged whenever, whenever people are looking for it, but also, and critically, it's social. So the majority of the cases, as I mentioned, are user generated. Um, and it's from verified clinicians who are posting under their real name. So if you're a cardiologist or an endocrinologist or an oncologist, you can be sharing cases with other people immediately in your kind of peer group, but then also globally and discussing them um, around the world as well. So that's kind of the, the, the value for users and you know how we've had that amazing growth um, to, 2 million, to 2 million doctors. Um, but what is in that from a pharmaceutical standpoint? Um, you know, what kind of benefits are there for the industry? I think two key things. One is essentially um, access and engagement. So the reach and engagement piece is, that is you know, to be honest, relatively easy. Um, but then it's also about education um, and behavior change and generating insights. Um, so on the engagement side, if we look at some diabetes and cardiovascular education that we ran here, so this is some cases that we're creating and then putting in front, in front of clinicians, um, we're seeing a really high level of uh, repeat engagement. So regularly we're seeing, you know, in the order of kind of 10 or more engagements per HCP, and that's partly because of the social construct and the case-based um, mechanic. Um, so people are receiving a notification if there's a post that they're following or if they've made a comment on a post and they're brought back into it. Um, and it's all framed around this case discussion mechanic rather than, you know, interruptive advertising. And then we're also generating some really great insights off the back of this. So not just the quant numbers in terms of who we're reaching and engaging, um, but also some more nuanced um, insights that we can compare with some of those quant insights as well. So we're looking at the comments and the case discussion and then summarizing that and reporting that back um, to, uh, to the client here as well. Um, I can see we've got some questions coming through here, which is great, but um, I think we'll aim to pick those up in the discussion at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, one other point I'd like to make just in terms of uh, the work that we're doing, um, and again, pandemic here is, 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 is relatively top of mind. Um, so we've engaged here in a, in a couple of ways. So firstly, to play an active role in supporting how it's been addressed. Um, so this is at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we launched educational cases and some open pages that got huge traction uh, from doctors as people were trying initially to kind of, you know, diagnose and, and treat uh, COVID. 
Um, you know, initial group that we had had 80,000 users and 80,000 members in a, in a week, and the engagements are well into the you know hundreds of thousands now. And obviously, that program has evolved as the pandemic has evolved. Um, but in addition, it gave us a really compelling data set that we can work from. Um, and we were one of the winners of an innovation award um, to build out what we're calling an early warning system. So that's essentially looking at co-occurring terms and intersections of terms, you know, frequency of men mention, and then combining that with geography. So we can essentially identify where that next major disease outbreak is coming from. So super exciting stuff that comes in addition with the sort of reach and engagement and behavior change side of things. Uh, so finally, just from my side and to kind of wrap that up, what does that mean and, you know, for the Medcoms community and the people on this call? I think, you know, firstly, and clearly from the answers to that first question, we're all aware of this, you know, the um, landscape has changed and, you know, Web 2.0 is very much the norm. So if plans and approaches aren't taking that into account, they are, they, they need to be updated, essentially. Um, secondly, this isn't you know, just about executing through new channels. It does need to be built on kind of first principles and customer needs. Otherwise, we just end up back in that slightly awkward situation with the unfeasibly uh, handsome and relaxed doctor. Um, I think on the plus side and thinking about Medcom specifically, um, you know, often the end materials that are being generated are of real value to HCPs. So, you know, in these in kind of complex and, and crowded environments, those preferences for medical and scientific content over branded advertising. And there's a huge opportunity to do more from a digital standpoint. So augmenting kind of traditional publication plans with an omni-channel approach or amplifying activities around a Congress. So that kind of data and content works really well on social peer-to-peer -peer platforms like MedShare. Um, but finally, yeah, it's about understanding the environment that you're operating in and then just ensuring what you're creating is actually of value to kind of that, that end audience. Um, but yeah, that's enough from me, I think. And what I will do is hand over to Antonia, who will give you the doctor's point of view on that. And as I say, we'll try and pick up those questions um, at the end of the call. Thanks, James. So what I wanted to talk about in a bit more detail was medical behavior. What is it that doctors are doing and how are they behaving? So are doctors the same as you and I? Um, next slide, please, James. Um, I think, you know, my um, experience as a doctor would, would lead me to an emphatic yes on that. Um, we heard that 96% of uh, uh, the population are using social media channels. Are doctors behaving in the same way? The answer, again, is yes, doctors do use social media. And yes, more than that, doctors also use their personal mobile for hospital-related work, for clinical work. And I think that this is the first point of difference, actually, to many other professional industries uh, where you know, work phones and, and the work environment is, is often separated, or at least separated um, by application. Um, instead, what we see is that doctors are often using the same uh, tools, whether that's um, WhatsApp and messaging um, or Twitter or even Facebook, um, that, that, that uh, they are using for their um, non-professional lives. Um, I think, you know, some of these uh, 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 behaviours uh, are also uh, changing in terms of the way that doctors are consuming and engaging with content. Um, so this is medical content. Um, and, and what we see again is that this is following the same trends that we see in other areas. So we're transitioning from longer form content to shorter form content. Um, it, we're prioritizing ease of access and we're seeking a greater collaborative engagement and, and user generated um, content. I think that the most compelling data uh, for this has been compiled by, oh, back please, sorry, sorry, James. Thank you. Um, compiled by uh, McKinsey, who uh, looked into the largest changes over the COVID period in terms of HCP uh, usage of online portals. And what they saw was that it was really this peer-to-peer -peer element that had uh, the greatest um, acceleration. Um, COVID's obviously had a huge impact here, but I think it is uh, really about a story of accelerating uh, trends that have been pre-existing, um, you know, across uh, both the medical community and non-medical communities. 
what are the challenges uh, for doctors if they are dipping their toes into the online medical world? And again, I think here we're, we're really looking to focus on the points of difference. And the first here is um, around compliance. I think whenever we're talking about physician engagement, it's something that's really important to remember. There's a huge amount um, of anxiety um, around this. Um, some of this is generated through the, the press um, and the GMC, but a real concern about clarity in terms of, of guidelines. And we see this all the time when we're speaking uh, to uh, doctors. The second challenge is that the landscape uh, and ecosystem isn't as well developed uh, for physicians. So we have a lot of platforms that are doing one thing really, really well. So for example, um, you might go uh, to the NEGM for your latest data and, and publications, those amazing review articles. You might think about um, accessing um, insights um, from, from SEMA or contributing um, to, 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 to that sort of survey um, process. Um, you may look to uh, Medscape, something I often did working in, in A&E was a, a quick search um, uh, and, and Medscape always really phenomenal in terms of uh, the information that they were able to pr provide to you, similar to up, up to date. And then Twitter, of course, offering this opportunity for that collaborative discussion around hot topics and those kind of short um, discussions. I think, you know, one thing that we often reflect on at, at MedShare is that we are relatively unique, and James has touched on this, um, this transition towards uh, the Web 2.0, um, in that we offer um, a combination of some of these elements. So access to discussions, data, um, but particularly this peer-to-peer -peer engagement and, and offering that opportunity for people to come together um, and, and share in, in whatever format um, they prefer. So what, what have we learned? Um, we've been doing this for um, over five years now, and I think there's some really key um, lessons. The first is that the, the need is there. We've seen really phenomenal growth across the globe in all specialties and all subspecialties. Interestingly, actually, um, one of the changes over COVID has been that societies have been a real um, growth driver for us. Um, so we're often thinking about um, in medcoms, um, the uh, opportunity to connect with physicians, but actually medical societies have had a lot of the same challenges where their conferences and, and events um, have been halted and, and, and they're looking to find an opportunity to engage within a digital ecosystem. The second thing is that trust is uh, really vital. And this, this links to the, the issues about um, compliance um, you know, I think that there's a lot of concern about it, but actually it is easier than you, you think. So we deliver this um, via a peer-to-peer -peer activity. As James said, everyone posting under their own names, no uh, anonymization um, of, of professionals, um, but actually importantly, all cases and all content has to be um, anonymized. So in terms of patient uh, details. None of that is allowed to be shared um, on the app. And we have some really neat functionality that allows you to kind of blur um, items as well as get in-app consent, uh, which is obviously crucial. The next thing that we've learned is that delivery matters. So we are biased towards cases because that's where we started, but Medch has grown since then um, to include many, many different types of content. But fundamentally, there is um, a, a consistent um, finding that we have, which is that short form is always better than long form and always performs uh, better, whether that's looking at how we can uh, get people to engage with um, cases or data and publications or uh, podcasts or, or video clips, actually, uh, we find that people are much more likely to engage with something that has been broken up into multiple elements that they can dip in and dip out of. The second thing is that uh, variety is, is really important. So we're able to A-B test a lot of different uh, content positionings, um, and we can track and understand actually what is it that brings people back. And we've seen that having variation, whether that's in terms of multidisciplinary interaction. Um, so you may be a cardiologist, but actually you're often interested in also talking to your 
uh, um, nephrology colleagues. Um, we've learned that expert discussion really counts, but actually so does peer-to-peer -peer content. So people love to engage with um, a leading KOL, but actually they're also really interested to see what um, you know, their colleague down the corridor um, ha has done. And then interestingly, um, something for us that, that was a bit of a surprise is that, uh, that the relatively agnostic um, around the uh, kind of sponsored versus non-sponsored um, content positioning. So I think we had we had thought that um, initially it may, it may be more of a challenge to, to um, include sponsored um, elements, but actually what one thing we've been able to do very effectively is leverage that very high quality content that, that James talked about um, and provide that in an accessible way, which may, has meant that we've been able to um, get, get really good uh, interest and engagement around it. What else then? Um, micro learning. Um, so micro learning is a, a huge opportunity. So what do we mean by micro learning? Uh, we're talking about very small uh, bits of information uh, which you are exposed to multiple times. And we've seen that um, in uh, education theory, um, there's been a lot of research showing that um, information retention is significantly increased if people are being exposed to the same content um, at least three times um, over a 30 day period. I and mean, we've been able to see some of the effects of that through our education program. So we're always interested to understand impact. Um, and again, what we've been able to see is that by uh, drawing people back into the same content or various iterations of the same theme, uh, we can deliver better outcomes. The final element here is about um, reaching a broad audience. So on MedShare, what we can see very clearly is that people participate to different levels. I think that this uh, mirrors what we see on other social media platforms. So you have everything from the very active uh, super users who will be creating, sharing out um, and encouraging their networks um, to, to join and contribute all the way through to the much more passive uh, participation. So these are the people that are looking to um, come and access and read um, and engage without necessarily contributing um, themselves. Now, I think one of the things here that we've been able to do is to uh, encourage those more passive um, uh, participators into a more active positioning, whether that's through um, commenting um, or sharing, um, or indeed creating uh, more micro communities um, on the platform that are, are developed according to a particular specialty or subspecialty um, area. I think the final thing to say on this is that MedShare is um, relatively unique in terms of the way that we deliver educational um, content. Um, so if you imagine a doctor has, has joined um, the platform because they're a member of a society or because they are sharing with their colleagues, what we're able to do is to um, drive them very naturally um, through a very discoverable feed and content sharing uh, mechanism to lots of other content um, that they find um, interesting and, and seek out. So they don't need to necessarily be searching for things. They don't necessarily even need to be um, uh, you know, uh, members or, or signed up to, to various groups, but actually that scrolling mechanism um, that we, we know we're kind of familiar with across other platforms can really be uh, used to um, our advantage. Awesome. Thanks, Antonia. And we're going to break from some discussion, but just very quickly before that, just kind of revisit the sort of the evolution of the web um, and everything we've just heard in terms of doctor behavior and, and med share. So the key question, obviously, is which decentralized blockchain and cryptocurrency should you be investing in for Web, web 3.0? I really need to do this in person to see how badly that, that joke actually bombs, because I have, I have no idea. Um, but no, terrible sort of crypto joking aside, hopefully we've seen that shift from 1.0 to 2.0 is very real. Um, it's real for us, but it's also real for, for doctors who are engaging accordingly and sort of the landscape, both from a sort of a farmer owned and third party is 
uh, behind, but looking to, to catch up. Um, so it does require a shift in, in thinking when we're kind of planning and delivering with clients. So thinking less static, more about interaction, um, thinking about the community, the types of media that's being created and how quickly we can, we can get that out to ensure it's as relevant as possible. Um, and it's thinking about, yeah, really harnessing the power of, of kind of Web 2.0 to generate behavior change and insights, not just those kind of clicks and views. Um, from a medcom standpoint, I think, yeah, we've touched on this, but yeah, massive opportunity. Um, you know, the area we're working on or the medcoms community works on is of high value to doctors. So data publications and other kind of scientific content really of value. And then delivering that in this sort of web 2.0 construct is really powerful. Um, I did see there are a couple of questions about CME and, and accreditation. Yeah, absolutely. We can work to CME accreditation. Also doctors on platform can get um, CPD accreditation from their own posts as well. So we can, we can work that both ways essentially. Um, but finally, and the final thought really is that, yeah, this needs to come from the perspective of your customers. Um, so it was great to have Antonia on the call and uh, to talk to that. And the final thought before we move to a bit of Q&A um, that we'd like to leave you with, if you're kind of thinking about this presentation, is if you were actually a doctor and you were using MedShare and you were sharing something with a colleague in that kind of digital social context, you know, what is it that you would actually share and then how does that compare with kind of the existing plan and the way that you're executing against it? So that's yeah everything from us. I'll hand back to um, Peter in case you wanted to sort of facilitate any of the conversation. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, James. Um, so that's great. If we can lose the slides and come back to us, but that was great. Um, a reminder to the members of the audience that um, we've got our two chat boxes and please do send in some questions, observations comments and we'll weave that into the discussion and um, can I just pick up on just just come back to basically to MedShare itself and just clarify a couple of things um, I think are, are sort of obvious but just to to clarify um, it's physician only isn't it? It, it, it basically it's physicians only and how do you how do you manage that process what's the verification process just so I understand the context there yeah, so we have a dedicated verification team. Um, so when you sign up, um, you're asked to input your relevant information, um, your details, uh, and obviously confirm an email address. If that is, um, for example, an NHS um, email address or from uh, you know, another hospital, we can kind of auto verify you. If you don't have that um, email, then you go into our verification process, which involves having a photo ID um, that kind of confirms your, your name, your credentials, et cetera. And you have go through a manual verification process um, in order to give you access. Okay, and just to just out of interest, I don't know the answer to this question, um, but I am I am someone that was around right at the beginning. I, I am that old sort of thing, so I've I've sort of seen things develop and different ideas being tried and so on. And um, there was at one stage quite a little phase of of people trying to establish sort of doctor identity type systems. Um, and I, I honestly, I don't know where they went or how how successful they were. Have you got a view on that? Is there anything like that around um, these days or not? So it's really challenging. And actually one of the interesting challenges for us in terms of verification is that we want doctors to be using MedShare as part of their day-to-day. -day. And actually what we often see is that people will therefore sign up with their kind of quote-unquote home address, okay. right? Um, and so actually, you know, uh, I think that that's one important thing that we, we are always considering emails and whether we confirm against that. Actually, we need to be really explicit about the types of information and why we need that information um, in order to be able to first validate, confirm who they are, um, and then be able to, to verify. Because all of that comes back to that, that trust piece. You know, what we're trying to say is that, you know, we're, we're collecting this in order that we can um, make this a professional and secure network and so that you have confidence um, in terms of who the people are that you will be but that's, but that's your system, yeah. So, so I, as I said, I don't know the answer to this question. Have, have the doc checks and systems like that disappeared? Are they still around? Because there, there was the idea was that there were lots of different platforms. The doctor could get one identity and use that to access different platforms and so on. I, I just don't. I just wondered if those systems are still around. I, I think those have floundered largely to, to, due to some of these challenges in terms of, 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 of uh, yeah, okay. platform um, issues. 
Okay, okay, okay. Um, and so a couple of quick questions coming in. Uh, you, you did sort of say, but I think it's 90 countries. So uh, is it 90 countries, something yeah, like that? So it's, it's not fully, just UK fully positions. Global, fully global. It is completely global, uh, yeah. Okay. We, yes, and yes, yeah. we do verify uh, uh, globally. Uh, and as I said, a lot often that is based upon ID. Um, if we're working with societies or hospitals, um, we have a what we call a one-click uh, process where we can uh, pre uh, verify members so that can be another way that we can you know work directly and make sure that it is very easy for people to to sign up and be verified just follow, if, follow if that just, more around, sorry, go on, James, go on. just quickly if the question is more you know practical in terms of engaging the audience then yes absolutely so it's, it's i think it's 100 over 190 rather than the 90 but you know we have a very strong footprint as you might expect in the eu5 um, or g5 in in europe um, but also, you know, US is a big market for us. And then we've also done a lot of more kind of utilitarian focused work um, in terms of educating in low and middle income countries. So some of our global kind of global health work, um, we have a really strong audience in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, but yes, there is definitely the ability to, to connect all around the world. Okay, and and um, again, just a couple of quick questions following my line of thought for the moment. But it's free to access for the healthcare for the uh, for the physicians, isn't it? So so basically, the funding model is what industry funding of one sort or another. Because what else is there, sort of thing, or is there other options you've got? Predominantly commercial wise, yeah, it's a vast majority is through our commercial programs where we are partnering with you know medical and and marketing teams uh, on the pharmaceutical and device side. Um, we do have some revenue through society partnerships um, and a couple right. of other avenues, but yeah, majority is industry. Yeah. Okay. And on that point, I was just interested in the whole medical society thing interests me at the moment. So just, I, I'm not sure whether you, I was, I was clear on it. Are you formally allying with medical societies to provide services to their membership? So they just go, here's my membership, you know, and, or is it more, is it less formal than that? Sorry. I'm, do you know what I'm trying to get? I'm just trying, I'm just interested in how, that works because the medical societies are very keen at the moment to try and find ways of engaging with their audience. I mean, it's one thing to say that there's a platform that you can link over to. It's another thing to integrate and formally partner with. I just wondered where you were on that one. You see so what I'm saying? There's, yeah, absolutely. So there's a real range. So there are some partnerships that we have that are very formal, where we're looking at integration, upload, uh, joining all their members onto the platform. Um, they're using MedShare as a kind of technology basis for them to engage their, their members. Um, actually, one of the things they often like is also being able to interact with the wider global community. So, for example, if they have conferences, events, courses and things like that. That's the kind of one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have more informal um, arrangements. And often that's for smaller groups um, uh, and um, hospital teams and things like that. Uh, where what we're saying is actually, here's a great platform, um, you know, you're welcome to, to use it, and then we have a team that can help uh, facilitate that. Okay, okay. And, and in terms of the global, someone, I think it was Alan was asking, in, in terms of the global content and so on, I mean, how much do you have to um, translate to local language versions and so on? Is it mostly English language, all English language? How do you deal with those sorts of issues? Um, so the majority of the content that's shared on MedChat is in English, though we have lots of pockets of discussion um, that are occurring in other languages. Actually, I think one of the things that's really been beneficial over the last three to five years is the development of uh, translation tools online. So you're able to very seamlessly translate um, through the web platform um, using some of the add-ons and, and plugins. And we see a lot of members um, doing that as well. Just to, again, put a bit of a commercial overlay on that. I don't know if Alan, that was the, the, the purpose of, or, or the, where the question was coming from, but um, we actually did, so we have about sort of 50 concurrent live programs in terms of, you know, medical and, and marketing programs that we're working on with, with industry at any given time. We do quite a lot of global work um, it's not necessarily all 195 countries. Sometimes it's specifying, you know, a specific 12 or 15 markets that, um, you know, an industry might be looking to engage HCPs. Um, and we, we often can do that. And the benefit is that sort of consistency of kind of the cases that are being created and the messages that are being delivered. Um, in instances where, you know, there is a, a need for specific sign off in every individual local market, that's obviously something that we can work to, but actually we've seen quite a lot of success and at that, 
higher level within industry, the desire for efficient reuse and consistency of message is something that we can deliver. You know, the, the stats you see around, you know, a global campaign being created and, you know, sometimes tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of efficient inefficiency for a big farmer each year on the lack of reuse. Um, so yeah, that, that can be a, you know, a compelling reason for utilization of the platform, but equally we can go on a market by market basis as well. And we can apply, you know, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we can say for European countries, we want them to see these cases, but for LATAM, then we want to see them, them see these other cases. Okay. Uh, Charlotte's just asked, have you got the ability to ask, um, uh, like conduct physician surveys? I think you did touch on it or implied that you do do survey work as well as the education work. Is that just a yes? I think, again, I'll put, I can pick that up commercially and then Antonio, if there's anything else more broadly on community, but, um, and also Charlotte, lovely sees a few questions from you, I think, so very happy to connect separately and, and discuss if that's of interest. But, um, We've consciously not gone down a route of monetizing surveys on platform. So any um, of the surveys that clinicians are interacting with aren't monetized specifically, which is um, dissimilar to, to some other platforms. Um, there's also a lot of surveys that doctors themselves are, are creating um, and adding. So there's somebody that does a sort of morphology Monday every day and adds some, some, um, some polls in there. So what we tend to do is to bake in the physician surveys into broader educational programs that we're running. So just for argument's sake, if we're running something in a rare disease, we want to include some surveys around understanding an appropriate diagnosis and referral. So we can track that over time. And if we deliver six educational cases or you know, we're releasing the publications and the data, we can understand what impact that has had in terms of the ability to diagnose and refer. So um, yes, we have the capability to do it, but we tend to do that as a wrapped up in a broader program rather than just running a, a short, sharp survey. Okay, and, and again, a, a long question from me, but I'm just interested. Um, the uh, you know, following the point, this is physician only, and you talked about I think um, uh, Antonio was talking about multidisciplinary, but it was amongst physicians um, you know particularly with cases there's an awful lot in the last few years of, and, and education of, of around you know multi true multidisciplinary so other types of healthcare professions and so on are, are working around a case and I just wondered um, I suppose as an observation you know how do you see your role can you play a part in that would you extend your service offering to include other members of the healthcare team I, I just wondered what your your views were on that sort of so, scenario as I'm painting yeah, ap apologies for any confusion on this MedShare is predominantly physician based so it's about 80 percent of the membership are physicians but we do include other healthcare oh so it's not absolute okay sorry mm -hmm. okay all right. so, yeah so we also have dentists um for example nurses okay. um, uh, biochemists clinical um lab workers etc um so you know the majority um of, of the platform is physician but it's exactly that so we actually have a whole series of programs that are um particularly some of our global health initiatives um that are looking uh, beyond just the physician or audience okay, um, okay well you must i'm glad i asked the question because that that i think that's a, that's that's an important clarification actually um mm -hmm. and particularly around cases that multidisciplinary approach is is, is valuable so um you know, and there are lots and lots of other healthcare professionals who can get involved in this. So, the, the, I mean, the opportunity for you to expand that uh, community is huge sort of thing. So, OK, so I, I'm glad I asked that question, for at least for my own sake of clarification. Um, we, we're going to run out of time. I know we're always going to run out of time on these sorts of things, and there's lots I would love to talk about. Um, but just, just to come back to a, a fundamental question, and Antonio, I'm going to sort of put you on the spot here. Um, you know, I, I've heard what you've said about changing behaviours and how you're adapting to it and so on and so forth. But just, just stand back a little bit and just talk a little bit more generally as a health as, as a physician with you know lots of physician type friends and contacts and so on just can you comment for a minute or two on how behaviors change how they're engaging with virtual activity or not the whole sort of on-site online type scenario do you see challenges ahead do you see you know I, I don't want to put words in your mouth but just comment for a couple minutes as a, as a healthcare professional as a doctor how do you see things changing in the real world and how has it been accelerated in the last couple of years and how might it impact on anything we do not just as, from a med share point of view do you see what I mean just broaden it a bit so I think you know it is obviously incredibly difficult to change true behavior and actually to measure 
um, real behavior um, change. And I think that, you know, everybody uh, that, that works in, in this area is well aware of that. I think what it's not difficult to do um, is to build knowledge and understanding. Um, and it's not difficult to engage physicians in real world um, cases. And I think speaking from my experience as a doctor, you know, actually, you know, cases are the language of how you learn, how you share, how you discuss your whole daily working life is about that patient case, which you are sharing, communicating with your colleagues multiple times a day. So as a unit of discussion, it's actually hugely familiar. Um, and I think that actually doctors, other healthcare work workers are very familiar with engaging with it um, and learning through that mechanism. So um, I think, you know, for, from my perspective, working um, a, as a doctor, um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think from, from our perspective at, at MedShare, we can very clearly track in terms of understanding um, and whether that's recognition, diagnosis, investigations. But the bit that's obviously trickier is about how that then translates um, away from the digital world into clinical practice. But again, we have a window into that because um, clinicians share their own cases. They say, here is a patient that I saw and this is what I did. Um, and so we can start to see with the larger data sets, actually, you know, what are those trends? How, how, how is it working? Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to go is, is a, just as a broad oversimplification with sweeping statement type of ending to the thing. You know, are your medical colleagues or either other physicians gagging to get back to face to face type events of all sites, case history, meetings, up to conferences, or are they now just, no, we just happy working that way. I'm just trying to get a sense from, as a, as a, as a physician, a sense of what you think is going on on that broader level. Okay, so people love an event. People love an event, as long as it's not too frequent. And as long as it has all the, the, the kind of interesting um, opportunities to get face-to-face, -face. and it's, you know, face-to-face -face with their colleagues, um, but, there's a real challenge that in that people don't have the time um, to be able to dedicate to that. So I think it is, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, comparing two different things because people want to engage with that digital um, ecosystem. They want to be able to connect uh, with their peers. And I think that they would love to be able to, and at least my friends and colleagues that I've been working with are eager to go to events, but just not as many as they used to. So it's not that on a um, you know quarterly or, or even monthly basis that they that they will be interacting um, at events and conferences. It will be once a year. Um, but I mean, what I'm saying at the moment is I, I I I'm looking at myself and going I'm going to be very picky about what I do face to face, and I think everybody else is going to be as well. That has implications and ramifications for people who are organising events and societies and all this stuff. But I, I just think that's sort of blindingly obvious, but there's no reason why healthcare professionals wouldn't be any different. And and also there's the pressure from around them to say, you can't just disappear off for a few days for a, for a day's meeting anymore. It's just there's stuff to do. I mean, I'm sort of stating the obvious, but I just think it's nice to, you know, hear it from, from your side sort of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, you know, if there's anything that we learn, it's that, you know, behaviours and, and patterns mirror um, everyday life. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, um, we, we should be wrapping up. So, um, James, sorry, uh, have you got a couple of, you know, would you like to comment on that from your point of view, just to sort of by way of wrapping up? Or are you just oh, going to yeah, I think everything she said? Uh, no, I completely agree with, with everything Antonia said. And, you know, I've got, I've got some friends and family that, you know, are specialists in, in general practice as well. Um, and I think that's that's definitely that that resonates. I think it's interesting the I've, I've, I've even seen people dialing into MDTs, you know, let, let's say they're not 100 percent connected on the, on the Zoom. They may be multitasking. So there are interesting um, implications, I think, in terms of more broadly exactly. around around outcomes as well. Um, but it, and, and there's a lot of data now that shows changing preferences as a result of COVID, which is. Yes, from specific types of digital channels, I'm interested in engaging through those. Yeah, I may be more selective about the events that I'm going to, for example. But ultimately, yeah, it comes down to what's actually of value to that individual and good execution. So interesting stats are, yeah, I really want to engage more through digital because it's easier for me and I don't necessarily want to be seeing a rep all the time. 
But equally, there's a lot of data to show I'm super frustrated because I'm, uh, you know, I'm a hemonk and I'm getting 100 emails a day from every pharma company because they're now trying to digitally contact me. So it's, it's about thinking about that experience. And to your point, there are commonalities in terms of all of us and doctors, but really thinking about it from their perspective and how do we deliver things that are of value through these channels as opposed to thinking about which channels are preferred. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Look, we could probably go in, on for a lot longer and there's a whole bunch of questions I'd like to pursue and I can't. Okay. Um, we should wrap up the, the recording. Uh, for those of you on the, on, on the, on the webinar today, uh, please don't run away if you don't have to, because we'll keep going to the top of the hour and it's quite nice to have a few minutes of unrecorded time. I'm sure there's some topics we can carry on talking about. Importantly, anybody watching this today or later on the video, um, I know you guys, I can say this, are very happy to hear from people. LinkedIn is the, is the obvious way. Part of the point of these webinars is just making connections these days. So I hope people watch this, get interested and, and then talk to you directly, whether it's about MedShare or the wider questions that you've raised. But I think that we did cover some interesting ground there um, and hopefully gave some people some food for thought so thank you very much for your time thank you to the audience for joining us um, uh, if anyone's interested in what I do medcomsnetworking.com is the place to go and, and certainly can talk to me about anything anytime and I'll see if I can help um, but for today uh, please take care of yourselves in these rather strange and uncertain times um, but can we all just give a wave say goodbye and, um, and wish everybody a good day bye bye